Yeah, hi everyone. I hope you had a nice week. So last week we discussed a lot of topics related to computational challenges with deep learning. So what do we do if we have these larger models? We uh, both require more data and more GPUs and also more time to train these models. So coincidentally this week I found a lot of news related to the topic of making yeah, the training of deep learning models more efficient. So that is by spreading out the computation across multiple devices in a process called federated learning. But then this also brings yeah, privacy concerns. So there was also some interesting news related to yeah, privacy protection. Uh, and lastly, um, I find personally the most exciting topic is how we can train these deep neural networks still on a single GPU. Because yeah, truth is most of us only have access to one or few GPUs. So uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could train just simply things on multiple GPUs, like hundreds of them. But yeah, in, in uh, real life, it's not so easy. So luckily, there are still a bunch of techniques that allow us to train deep neural networks, even the large ones, on single GPUs. So I will also discuss this topic at the end of today's uh, news session. But yeah, because there are so many topics I wanted to cover today, let me just dive in and get started. Yeah, let's start with federated learning. So last week I explained federated learning is yeah, um, learning on or using multiple devices, like splitting up a computation across multiple devices. So here was an interesting paper by researchers from Apple. So this paper was entitled Federated Evaluation and Tuning for On-Device Personalization, System Design and Applications. So this is essentially Apple's on-device machine learning system for federated evaluation and tuning. So federated learning is not new. I mean, a lot of people and companies use federated learning. That is yeah, using multiple machines to achieve something. So, but usually what other companies do is they use federated learning to tune a global neural network. So imagine, for example, you have a server with your deep neural network model, and this is, let's say, an image classifier or something like that. So then this uh, global model can learn from yeah, individual people. So if you have a cell phone or a smartphone, it can access this model on the server, and by if you label your data, you can provide training data for this model. So that's usually one uh, global model. I mean, not everyone is using that approach, but many uh, people are using this approach where you essentially have or keep one global model. In contrast, here in this paper, Apple describes a system where there are global parameters, but the model is trained locally. So all the user data remains inaccessible to the server side. So that means here they focus on protecting your privacy, so not sending any user data to a server. So all the training happens locally. So you may get some parameters from the global model, but essentially you will get a personalized model on your uh, yeah, phone, for example, without sharing your personal data with the server, which I find actually pretty cool. So here's just a sketch of how this works, where um, there are three types of information being shared. The red arrow is the task configuration and attachments information. Then in green, the task results and telemetry. And then on blue, these on-device records. And here, this one, the left box represents the end user device. And you can see for the blue ones, the blue ones are the user data, the on-device records. They never really... Uh, leave the device. So on the right hand side is the de developer interface. So what the developer interface has access to is uh, yeah, the task configuration and the task results. Because you as a developer, you still want to see whether the, yeah, the, mon uh, the learning model learns well. However, you don't want to see any user data because that would be yeah, then a privacy implication or problem. So here's an example of that where they show how this can be used for tuning for news personalization. So they have, for example, different models. Uh, let's call them run one and run two. And um, yeah, so here they involve different parameters and different metrics from an AB uh, experimentation result. So for example, which model should be used on a local system. And um, they only have access to information such as how much things improved, for example. So here they have a delta percent, so they can see basically um, that run two improved 
yeah, the uh, percent accuracy, the daily article views increased it by 1.87. And if your metric is to maximize the number of article views, if that's your metric, then you can measure this by just looking at the results. Um, you don't have to have access to what types of yeah, articles the user reads. Yeah, so in the previous slide, I highlighted these fundamentally different approaches to federated learning. One is keeping one uh, yeah, global model on the server and then sending user data to that server, which sounds from a privacy perspective a little bit, um, I would say, questionable. The second approach sounded a little bit more privacy friendly, where you do the training on the device and your user data never leaves the server. However, the first approach with a global model is actually not that bad if you take some precautions. So there's one area of research called differentiable privacy. Let me write this down, differentiable privacy. So this deals with, or this field develops methods for yeah, um, adding some noise to a data set such that you can't identify yeah, uh, people from this data set. So there was one interesting article by Microsoft, um, but of course, um, this is a broad field. Many people are working on this. I just highlight this article because it was yeah, just in the news. So, but uh, be aware that it's not the only approach to this. Um, but again, uh, just to highlight the problem. So if you share data with a server or with anyone, essentially, even if you don't let's say, have the names of the persons in that data set, it may be possible to identify uh, users or people from this data. So there was this $1 million Netflix price. It has been quite some year ago, I think maybe a decade ago even. There was this $1 million price where Netflix um, yeah, had a data set that they shared on Kaggle and they asked um, people to develop recommendation systems. And the best recommendation system, the be best movie recommender, or the person who developed this or the team would um, gain one million dollars. So in order to facilitate this competition, they shared a data set. It had the title, the title of the movie, the user ID, the date of the rating and the rating itself. So the user ID, you can think of it um, here. It is not identifying a particular person. It's just for helping to make sure um, if two movies are rated, whether they are rated by the same person or not, but you still don't know who the person is. Um, actually, I never really had Netflix, but I think they don't have these five star ratings anymore. I think it's working differently now. I'm honestly not sure, but I think they don't do ratings anymore, but probably back in the day they did. Anyways, um, so the thing here, what happened is that people used the IMDB movie review database and using this IMDB movie database and looking at this Netflix data set here on the left hand side, they were able to identify people in this data set. So how that worked was they, by IMDB, by I think by email or username, they could identify the person and then they were just matching the date of the rating and the rating itself to the records in IMDb and by that they could identify the user ID here um, to whom it belongs by just matching the date of rating and rating. If you do that for a couple of movies it becomes very easy to identify certain users by user ID and then you could yeah you can see basically all the movies that the person watched and how they rated that movie and that is I think a big um, privacy violation if you haven't agreed if you are a Netflix user and you haven't agreed to share that information of all the movies you watched um, then yeah that might be a privacy violation maybe you only have a subset on IMDB but you don't want certain people to see what other movies you watched then this would be problematic so differentiable privacy um, deals with this problem, how you can kind of keep the utility of a data set, so making the data set still usable, but avoiding the identification of individuals. So it's essentially the broad, um, yeah, the broad approach is essentially adding or synthesizing noise and adding noise to this data set so that the data set has broadly the same characteristics so if you would, for example, compute the average rating, the average rating may not change, but there's some noise that um, for a user, for a given user, some of the ratings are a little bit higher and lower than they were in real. So in that way, it's not so easy to go to IMDb and um, unambiguously identify these users. Um, yeah, and what's new here 
um, is that Microsoft released a tool set called Smart Noise. So in this Smart Noise, yeah, contains some Python API and other things to make uh, this more easy to use in practice. So um, there is also a, a sample GitHub repository where you can take a look at it, some examples. And I want to talk too much about the individual techniques. So they, it's basically a framework for implementing different techniques. But what I found interesting is from this list here of the techniques they implement, that uh, many of these techniques, they um, involve GANs. So GANs are generative adversarial networks. We will cover them later in this class. And they are used essentially to uh, learn the training data set distribution and then generating samples, new samples from that training set distribution. So we will cover that later in this class. I just found it interesting that most techniques for differentiable privacy seem to employ generative adversarial networks nowadays, or at least the techniques they implemented in this smart noise approach. Yeah, related to the topic of data set augmentation, I've seen this article this week entitled Humans are trying to take bias out of facial recognition programs. It's not working yet. So here in this article, um, the authors mentioned that one likely reason for this yeah, bias in face recognition is the lack of diversity in the data sets. And they say that one common mitigation approach is to provide algorithms with data sets that represent all groups equally and fairly. So there was a paper called One Label, One Billion Faces, Usage and Consistency of Racial Categories in Computer Vision by Zaid Khan and Yun Fu, who looked at this problem. So they looked at the problem whether diverse data sets can really help. And they say, yeah, it, only, uh, it can work, but only for a very stereotypical sense of fairness. So essentially it doesn't really work. So here's a quote, what they say is, the people in the images appear to fit racial stereotypes. For example, an algorithm was more likely to label an individual in an image as white if that person had blonde hair. So yeah, using even a more diverse data set doesn't really help with this bias problem. So it's still like um, yeah, having these stereotype uh, steps and stuff like that. So there needs to be more work done on developing systems that are more fair. So it's not as easy as making a data set more diverse. Yeah, an interesting yet unrelated topic is AutoML, which stands for Automatic Machine Learning. What is Automatic Machine Learning? Automatic Machine Learning is about finding yeah, good machine learning algorithms and hyperparameter settings and sometimes also pre-processing steps given a certain problem. So traditionally, we humans, we try out different algorithms and hyperparameter settings and yeah, data normalization steps and so forth to see what works well on a given data set. Uh, AutoML is, type, is a type of approach of automating this process so it's less work for us humans. It's some system uh, on top of machine learning that yeah, learns this how to do it well basically. So it's basically automating machine learning in a way. Um, a specific flavor of AutoML is neural architecture search. This is uh, specific to neural networks where AutoML can be broader. It can also involve yeah, traditional machine learning algorithms. A neural architecture search is a specific subfield of AutoML for neural networks. Sometimes also um, it's abbreviated as NAS for yeah, neural architecture search. Um, so here in this article, the article is entitled Introducing Model Search, an open source platform for finding optimal machine learning models. Um, there are a couple of other yeah, open source platforms for AutoML. And I had a, like a little bit of a hard time um, seeing what's new here. But what I think what's new is really that they uh, yeah, approach this problem a little bit differently. I mean, the method is slightly different than other methods. So methods I've seen before, they're usually based on reinforcement learning, evolutionary algorithms, or and or <laughs> combinatorial search. And here it's also looking like a combination of those, where they have um, multiple trainers uh, trained asynchronously. And then there's some beam search uh, going on, uh, looking at the results. And then considering the best models, they mutate them. So making small changes to the best performing ones, uh, which is kind of reminding me of how evolutionary algorithms work. Um, and they also talk about knowledge distillation and having some transfer learning here, or not literally transfer learning, more uh, sorry, more like a weight transfer. So here, 
when I recall correctly, what they do is they transfer the weights from well-performing models to new models they want to explore. So instead of starting from scratch. Um, yeah, so the results uh, looked actually pretty good. So compared to previous methods, so here the dotted lines are the previous methods, they found um, that their methods here, they perform the new method performs better than model search um, method. So yeah, my thought is really that this is um, fundamentally the building blocks are not that novel, but in the way they are put together, this is a system that performs really well. So I think that's the takeaway that this is really if you want to use it in practice, if you want to use something that performs really well, this might be a good approach. Um, yeah, what I found interesting though when I read this, um, they said in a recent paper we demonstrated the capabilities of model search in speech domain by discovering something. I think I cut it off. But um, yeah, so this is um, from this 2021 article and I said in a recent paper, I looked it up, uh, I looked at the paper, it's from 2019, so it's actually not that recent anymore. Um, I, th I st still think uh, this is an interesting approach. So if you ever want to attempt a uh, neural architecture search, this might be one of the approaches to try. I should warn you though, neural architecture search is of course very, very expensive because, yeah, uh, I mean, training a single deep neural network is already expensive. And here in this approach, uh, imagine you have to train multiple ones asynchronously. And yeah, this is uh, yet another computational challenge, I would say, for people who don't have access to hundreds or thousands of GPUs. Yes, yeah, speaking of computational scaling or training large scale models on multiple GPUs. So I saw this paper here, TerraPipe, token level pipeline parallelism for training large scale language models which is kind of interesting. So it's related to the GPT-3 language model, which has 175 billion parameters. And they found a way that they can train it five times more efficiently on 48 uh, large GPUs. So there are these uh, transformer models and there are different uh, ways you can make them more efficient. So um, one is partitioning the operations here, that's in uh, subfigure B where I think uh, this means that they just split the computation, let's say the left and the right hand side, and yeah, pass it onto multiple devices. So here device one and two. I think there is actually a label problem in that figure when I understand correctly, this should be actually part two here everywhere. Um, yeah, but here it's splitting up the computation across multiple devices by yeah, splitting it, uh, splitting the layer basically. Another uh, approach is this, uh, Micro batched parallelism or micro batched uh, micro batch based pipeline, where they split up the batches, the mini batches, into micro batches. If I understand it this correctly here, so they split it up into also multiple devices this way. And here the novelty is essentially that they have another method for parallelism, where they split up the input, the sequence input, into tokens. I mean, this is what you would do. Always, you would always split it up into token, but then they distribute these tokens onto across different devices. So each device may have a small number of tokens only to consider. So you have parallelism across these tokens, which is, uh, I think, the new approach here. Yeah, but now let's get to the real interesting part because this concerns training large scale models on a single GPU. So I saw this tweet here, a screenshot of a talk by Sylvain Guger, who uh, worked at Fast API. Yeah, now let's get to the real interesting part, training large scale models on a single GPU. So I saw this tweet here from a talk by Sylvain Guger, who works at Fast AI, which is a company yeah, of focusing on um, education around deep learning and developing also yeah, uh, friendly APIs for PyTorch. So here in this talk, um, Sylvain Guger summarized the main steps or main approaches for yeah, making large model training possible on a single GPU. One obvious one that uh, is the easiest also is to reduce the batch size. So the input batch size, because then if you reduce the batch size, you have smaller matrix multiplication. So that helps with yeah memory constraints because usually the yeah the problem with uh, GPUs is that you have a fixed size memory. So usually common, I mean not all of them, but common cards are between let's say 12 and 20 gigabytes of RAM. 
And this can be quite limiting, especially for these big models. And um, yeah, a bottleneck is usually matrix multiplication, especially if you have uh, fully connected layers, like the linear layers in uh, PyTorch. So reducing the batch size can help. Uh, another approach is gradient accumulation. It's kind of uh, related to the batch size. So if you have very small batches, what will happen is that yeah, your updates will be very noisy. So remember when we talked about online learning and stochastic gradient descent, we will also talk more about that when we talk about choosing learning rates and things like batch normalization. Uh, in any case, gradient um, accumulation is an approach where you essentially um, run backward in PyTorch twice. So you accumulate the gradients from multiple mini batches before you do the update, basically. So in that way, it allows you to use smaller mini batches. Another approach is gradient checkpointing. Uh, I actually made a um, brief figure about that. I will explain it to you in the next slide. And then there are also these approaches like um, zero, which has something to do with the optimizer and then also sharded uh, data, distributed data parallel. I will also yeah, explain to you how that works in a separate slide. And there's also model parallelism and pipeline parallelism. These are uh, related approaches where you put parts of the model onto separate GPUs. So imagine you have a model with a lot of parameters and they don't fit into one GPU. And this way you simply yeah, split the model across different GPUs. I also have a small slide about that because I found yeah, some interesting new tools that allow you to do that very conveniently. So here is a uh, yeah, visualization of uh, gradient checkpointing. I made that for a notebook. Um, I tried it out in practice uh, earlier this year. Um, so. Here, this drawing, I should say, is inspired by another post, though, that I recommend you to check out to read a more in detailed coverage of that if you're interested. So we talked a little bit about uh, gradient descent, and uh, we have only done it for smaller models like uh, softmax regression. But of course, the same concept applies if we have multi-layer perceptrons and uh, convolutional networks with multiple layers. So usually, we compute first the forward pass. And then we have a loss function. Let's say um, this is our output, the loss. So for that, you need the forward pass, but then also the signal from the class label. So let's say here you have the class label information and your prediction, and you use that when you backpropagate to uh, yeah, compute the uh, gradients. So traditionally, what happens is that uh, you keep all these orange nodes, the computations from these nodes in memory. So for different gradients, you will need these individual steps from the forward pass. And if you just run PyTorch regularly, for example, it will keep all these computations in memory because you will need them to update them. So for example, um, just in a very broad concept-wise manner. So in order to update this node during backpropagation, you need these two nodes. And then if you want to update this node, you need these two orange nodes. So while you're doing that, though, you don't you don't need this part, you will need it at the next step, right. But in that way, keeping it in memory is actually efficient in the given moment, because you will need the values later. But if you have memory limit limitation, um, this might be something where you want to offload this or you want to not keep it in memory. So gradient checkpointing, how it works is as follows. So you will compute the forward pass, but then you delete all this intermediate information because you're right now you're only focusing on updating this data point. So you only use this in this computation. You forget about this because let's say you can't keep it in memory, it's too big. But then when you um, update the second node here, for example, then uh, in that way, you recompute these nodes, for example, and you also recompute these these ones. So the blue ones are the ones that are recomputed. It's wasteful to recompute them every time. So essentially, when you use gradient checkpointing, the model training becomes slower because you have to recompute things. But uh, it still helps you dealing with the memory limitations because you don't keep everything in memory. So in both slides, so here, this is the regular approach. Everything in orange is always kept in memory. So you can see with gradient checkpointing here, you keep fewer things in memory, only the orange things are in memory, but you need to recompute. So there's a trade off basically between memory and computational efficiency. It's um, 
It's slower, but again, it helps you with memory limitations. Yeah, so the remaining things on the slide are um, sharding, zero, then uh, model parallelism and pipeline parallelism. So it sounded like based on the tweet that it was for single GPU use. Unfortunately, yeah, it requires multiple GPUs, but still it's, I think, a cool selection of things that we can use to make the model training more efficient. So I don't want to also discuss this in nitty gritty detail because that would be a lecture in itself, but just to give you a big picture overview. So zero redundancy optimizer, uh, that's a technique uh, developed by, um, I think it was developed by Microsoft, which developed this deep speed library. So there's a tutorial in this deep speed library that discusses what zero does in more detail. But the broad overview is that it is essentially about memory optimization using 16 bit floating point operations. And um, yeah, what's nice about it is in contrast to some other things that make model training more efficient, zero does not require any major modification of your model code. So in this way, it's more like a wrapper around your model, but it doesn't require you to modify the model significantly by yourself. So um, yeah, what it does, it's also then uh, reducing memory consumption. One is by yeah, the 16-bit training, but it's also partitioning um, the different states, uh, weights, gradients, and optimizer states across the available GPUs and CPUs. So that's why yeah, you need also multiple GPUs. However, um, that might be something worthwhile to consider if you have multiple GPUs and memory constraints. So related to that, there's also zero offload, which is um, yeah kind of related um, to offloading models. So here they even say that it works for models up to 13 uh, billion parameters. And they basically say that one of the bottlenecks is also using optimizers like Adam. Uh, so Adam is something we will be covering soon in the lectures, which is, Adam is still my favorite optimizer. It's actually super nice. Uh, it's very robust to, uh, yeah, for, it's very robust for training deep neural networks. It almost always converges compared to SGD and momentum where you need a little bit more fiddling, but we'll talk more about that in class. And they say they developed this uh, implementation, deep uh, D-speed CPU Atom, which is a implementation of Atom that is five to seven times faster than the standard implementation, which I also found interesting. So uh, yeah, related to all these techniques, also to the sharding, I also saw a tweet by um, the PyTorch developers, uh, about, so involving a library called FairScale, which is developed by Facebook AI Research. And this is a PyTorch extension for efficient large scale training. And it uses this fully sharded data, a data parallel um, approach. So sharding is essentially um, yeah, also a form of splitting the weights. So again, here's an article if you are interested in more detail how sharding works. So this article describes sharding. And here on the left hand side, this is a uh, yeah, combination between parallel data training, so um, distributing the mini batches across GPUs and the sharding. So it's a, a new thing that just got added to this library. I haven't tried it yet, but it also looks like another yet uh, yeah, cutting edge, interesting approach. So it's actually based on the deep speed Microsoft research library. But I think um, yeah, the goal here in fair scale is to make it a little bit more um, easier to use within PyTorch. So I looked at some things that Fairscale provides. So what I also found interesting was this um, pipeline parallelism in Fairscale. Uh, I found this particularly interesting because it looks like super easy to use. So here's a, a problem where you have, for example, the model that doesn't fit into a single GPU. And let's say you have a second GPU that you could use. Um, technically, what you could do is all the other tricks I mentioned before, like reducing the batch size and so forth. Uh, here, what you could do is you can just put also different parts of the model on different GPUs, simple, uh, very similar to the model parallelism, except that uh, we use a PyTorch pipeline here. So the PyTorch sequential pipeline. We discussed this, um, I think, when we discussed the PyTorch API in lecture five. So where I showed you how you can have multiple layers in a sequential 
API. So here you can also use the sequential API for the distributed training. So if you have multiple layers, let's say layer A and a, layer B are two layers, C and D are two more layers, you can put them all into your sequential pipeline and then it will automatically take care of it, distributing it across devices. So here across two devices, two GPUs, and you can also say how balanced um, these are. So you maybe can say uh, if you have a stronger GPU, put more onto the first GPU than the other GPU and so forth. And then also, yeah, there's a chunk parameter. So yeah, that is uh, something I will probably try out pretty soon. I haven't uh, played around with that yet, but it looked super cool uh, because it's yeah simple to use. But yeah, if you have one GPU, this would of course be a bottleneck, but uh, so it would still be a problem. So in that way, I would rather consider reducing the batch size and gradient checkpointing if you have a single GPU. All right, so it was probably a very long video. I will just um, stop it at this point and I will see you back in class on Monday.